I hope you're all feeling alert this afternoon. What you see in front of the screen is not what you're expecting. What I'm going to share with you today is one of the most amazing things that you could ever imagine. Absolutely true but incredible. And all glory goes to God, as you'll soon see. Before we get into it, let's just uh, bow in prayer and uh, we'll invite his blessing. Loving Father, we are here this afternoon to glorify you, to consider something that you have done which is so amazing, so wonderful, it could only have come from you. And as we read it, we will also see wonders in your word that make your word so much more exciting and, and interesting and lovable. We commit this whole meeting into your care, Lord, and we pray that you will guide that nothing human will enter into this, but that the message will be from you to each soul today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Now, before we get into the picture side, I'd like us all to turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Now here, God gave to his ancient people a set of seven holy festivals the festivals of the Lord himself. And I just want you to notice something before we get into the subject. Leviticus 23, and uh, you notice that here in verse um, 4, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Now there's seven of them. Verse 5, the first one. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. The second one, verse 6. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now you'll notice that in the third one comes in verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come unto the land which I will give you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto, unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And the timing is given again. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Then verse 15, the fourth one. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And uh, then verse 17, And ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And then verse 24 comes at number five feast. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day, of the month shall be her Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Then the number six feast, verse 27. 
Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And verse 28, And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. And then comes the seventh feast, verse 34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. Okay, now, having read that, you'll notice that there's a particular set time for each of those events. And uh, that timing is absolutely incredible because I'm going to share with you something that you may never have put with this. Okay, God is very, very good and, and uh, he's the one that organised this. Now, in the beginning, there was no sin. In the beginning, God created this world as, as a beautiful environment for his people whom he loved. And when you look out at the trees and the flowers, I mean, he could have made everything black and white, couldn't he? We see all the beautiful colours, the lovely shapes, everything so wonderful. Then we hear lovely sounds, the beauties of nature, running water, the songs of happy little birds and so on. I mean, they could all sound like scraping on a blackboard. But God made it pleasant for us because, why? He loves us. He wants us to enjoy what he has made. He takes great delight in our happiness. So he did that. And uh, everything was wonderful. But who spoilt it? We turned our backs on God. And he had laws, laws for us to live by, which were based on his love. You honour these laws. You, your fellow man is happy around you, and God is happy. The laws are for expressions of our love to others, love to God and love to man. And when we do this, everybody's happy, or we should be. If we follow God's way, we'd be happy. But what happened with our first parents? They turned their back on the laws and followed the tempter. And the result was chaos and disaster which is getting worse by the day thank god jesus is coming to end it soon and bring bring everything back beautiful again because our turning our backs on god brings nothing but death uh, that's not god's plan for us now god's solution god's answer prophesied in the book of isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 Unto us a child is born. You know that text, don't you? Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, and so on. Unto us a child is born. And so Jesus uh, was made in the likeness of human flesh. And Philippians chapter 2 is one of my favourite parts of the Bible, friends. Jesus' wonderful love in condescending to become one of us so that he could lift us up and help us and bring us back to God. And God was in that love. It, it was agonising for him to sacrifice his son for us. He didn't deserve that kind of treatment. But he wants to give us what he deserves and so he took upon himself what we deserve and it, it broke his heart on the cross. And he took our place before he went to the cross. And uh, when he took our place, he stood there in our position, position of fallen man, to fight Satan and defeat him. And so we know now that he can fight Satan for us if we just shelter ourselves under him. 
He wants to do that for each individual. He's defeated the enemy already. All he wants is for us to come on his side and he'll defeat him for us as well. Now, to a massive new life is going to be given to us and to receive new life through Jesus, we must be, as Jesus said, born again. Jesus became a child for us. Unto us a child is born. He wants us now to be born into his kingdom, just like he was born into ours, and he will give us life. Put to death and bury our old life. Let his life take over, and Jesus will give his example and show his example through us to others. New life to us and new life to those who, who respond to the pleading of his spirit. Now the steps that, and this is the important key for today's subject, the steps that Jesus would go through to bring us this new life were prophesied in these seven feasts of the Lord that we just read about. That's the story of what Jesus would go through for us. These new moon feasts are called by Paul a shadow of things to come. They were a prophecy of what Jesus was going to do for us to bring us new life. And these seven feasts were Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, and they were prophecies of the beginning of the Christian era. Those things happened uh, with, starting with the death of Jesus. They, they went right through and, and the, the days that followed were a prophecy, were prophesied by the seven feasts given to Israel. The last three are a prophecy of events closing the Christian era. Trumpets, atonement, tabernacles. Unto us, that's the theme, unto us a child is born. Now an obstetrician actually who has delivered more than 10,000 babies has revealed an incredible parallel in the time sequence and God gave, gave the, the seven feasts to Israel and God has given the birth process of a baby to be born into a new world with a new life which is a symbol of what God is going to do with us eternally. In the seven feasts, there's a perfect picture of the pre-birth development of a human child. Now, the text as we just read it before, Passover. In the 14th day of the first month is Passover. Now, Passover was a prophecy of the death of the Lamb of God to give you and me eternal life. Now, what this doctor revealed is absolutely astonishing. I'm going to share it with you. Pregnancy begins, a new life, is counted from the first day of the last menstrual cycle before conception. So that's the starting point. On the 14th day of the first month, the egg appears. Did you get that? Now let's look at salvation. On the 14th day of the first month, Christ's death made possible our new life. Is that correct? That's right. Now in the unborn human baby, the 14th day of the first month, the egg appears inside the mother for the new life. Now the second feast is unleavened bread. 
on the 15th day of the first month is the feast of unleavened bread. Now the feast of unleavened bread is a picture of the burial of Jesus. Because the very next day after Jesus was crucified on the cross was the Sabbath and Jesus was buried in the tomb. Of course, we know that this made the Sabbath twice holy. First, he rested on the Sabbath after having created this world and then after having redeemed man on the cross, Jesus rested in the tomb. He was buried. Now unleavened, leaven is a symbol of sin. Unleavened, Jesus was sinless. And so the sinless one lay buried in the tomb for you and me. Jesus himself said this, I am the living bread which came down from heaven and the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give that's I will give in, cru in being crucified for the life of the world. So Jesus' death is to give you and me life. Then he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth not. But if it die, it brings forth what? Much fruit. Okay. The feast of unleavened bread was a prophecy of Jesus being buried. The seed is planted. And just as a seed is planted in the ground, Jesus was buried. And the tomb stone was rolled over. Now, how soon, here's a question that was asked of the doctor, how soon must the mother's egg that appears on the 14th day, how soon must the mother's egg be fertilised if pregnancy is to occur? That's where the sperm comes and is buried in the egg. And the osteo, the osteo, uh, how do we say this? Osteo. Oh, there you are, much better than me. Her reply was: fertilization must occur within 24 hours of the egg appearing, or the egg will pass on. So the egg appears on the 14th day of the month, and if there is to be life. It must, the sperm must be buried on the 15th day. The burial must take place on the 15th day. Salvation comes to us because on the 15th day of the first month, Jesus was buried in the tomb. The unborn human baby on the 15th day of the first month, the sperm is buried in the egg and that's called fertilization. Now the third feast that God ordained his people to show the plan of salvation, new life, the morrow after the Sabbath, wave the sheaf of the first fruits before the Lord. Okay? What does that mean? It means, friends, simply that the day after the Sabbath, there was going to be an appearance of the first fruits before the Lord. Now, who is this first fruits? Remember, Jesus said to Mary on Sunday morning, after the day after the Sabbath, and, and when she saw who he was, she wanted to brush and touch him. He'd come out of the tomb. She had come to embalm the body, but here he was alive. She first thought it was the gardener, 
But when she realized it was Jesus and he said, Mary, she wanted to rush and hug him. And he said, touch me not. I have not what? Ascended yet to my father. But later that same day, when doubting Thomas could not believe this was Jesus alive, what did Jesus say? Touch me. See if this is not me or not. Put your hand in the, in the wounds. So between the time of Mary in the morning and the time of Thomas that night, Jesus had presented himself before the Father. Okay? And he had received approval, official reproval for what he had done on the cross before he had come back to earth and allow anybody to touch him. Christ is called the first fruits. He is the first fruits that's weighed before the Lord. The first fruits from the dead. And that appeared, what day did that happen? It happened the day after the Sabbath. Now the timing is very important. You'll notice it put up here on the board. What a perfectly timed day of the month. And it was not a, a day of the month that was like the other two. The first one was the 14th day of the month. The next one was the 15th day of the month. But this third event was not according to the day of the month. It was according to the day of the week. And that changes. Each month has a different day of the week starting it. And so this was the day out to be the day after the Sabbath. And as it turned out, Jesus went to heaven on the day after the Sabbath, presenting himself as the first fruits and gaining official acceptance and glorification before he could go back to earth and allow people to touch him. And uh, this is actually, if it's to be the day after the Sabbath, that's a change of timing in Leviticus. It's according to the day of the week. It had to be the day after the Sabbath. And that means it could happen on the second day uh, after the, the second feast or up to the sixth day after the second feast, sometime, but it had to be on the day that followed the, the weekly Sabbath. Okay. Now, the doctor was asked, what happens next after the first two events? The appearance of the egg and then the uh, burial of the sperm in the egg. And the doctor said, well, that's a little bit indeterminate. The fertilised egg travels down the tube at its own speed. It may take anywhere from two to six days before it implants. Again, it's not a specific day like the first two. Okay. The doctor used the word implant and the implanting takes place in the womb two to six days after the fertilisation. The fertilised egg arrives in the womb and begins the miraculous growth into a human being. Now, salvation. Two to six days after the weekly Sabbath. It must come after the weekly Sabbath immediately, but two to six days after the previous event. Christ rose from the dead. And this corresponds perfectly with the, uh, the feast of first fruits becoming a seed planting feast. Now the unborn baby, two to six days later, the egg is implanted in the womb and begins growth into a new human being. There we have the first three feasts. Firstly, on the 14th day of the first month, Christ the first fruits is, is dies. On the second feast, on second feast, the uh, Christ is buried. On the third feast, Christ rises as the first fruits. 
human baby, on the 14th day of the first month, the egg appears for a new life. On the 15th day of the first month, the sperm is buried in the egg. And two to six days later, the egg implanted in the womb to begin growth into a new human being. Isn't that astonishing? Here we've got the birth to a new life of a new creature in Christ being made possible by the steps Jesus was taking. And here, in physical terms, we've got the new life of a new human being going to the same identical time schedule. And then there comes a 50-day wait before the next festival, which is Pentecost. Pentecost was called Feast of Harvest and it must occur 50 days after. Okay? And so the book of Acts tells us that when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully come. So it had to be precisely at that time. At that time there was a harvest of 3,000 people the first fruits of Jesus' seed sowing over, over all the time he had been on earth were presented now before God. And uh, the Bible does say to us that the field is the world and he that soweth the good seed is whom? The Son of Man. So Jesus was waiting for the first fruits of his work to be declared and on that day of Pentecost when it was fully come that happened. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was indication that the Saviour's inauguration and glorification was now accomplished and the Bible tells us that this couldn't happen until he had been glorified. And the Christian church was given life through the death, burial and resurrection of our Lord. But it took on the appearance of structured form only at Pentecost after the 50 days of waiting. Now the doctor was asked, is, is the 50th day important? And the doctor said, well, up to the 50th day, you wouldn't know if you're going to have a duck or a cocker spaniel. But on the 50th day of the embryo, that's the unborn child, it becomes a human fetus and the shape is discernible. Isn't that amazing? Life begins at conception but the embryo takes on the structured appearance of a human form around the 50th day. Now relating to your salvation and mine, 50 days after Jesus' death on the cross, he was glorified already in heaven, so now the church can take on structured form. Unborn baby, 50 days after conception, the embryo takes on structured form. Then there's a huge gap. You first of all have Passover, representing the death of Jesus, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, representing his burial, the Feast of First Fruits, representing his Ascend his, uh, his uh, resurrection and ascending to heaven to be glorified and then Pentecost where the first fruits of his labours take place and the church shows structured form. And then nothing happens in, in the seven Bible feasts until the seventh month. It's a long time from, the, from Pentecost to the seventh month. Big gap. After the 50th day in a human fetus, 
Progress is fairly general with nothing momentous happening until the first day of the seventh month of pregnancy. Okay. The Bible feast that was to occur on the first day of the seventh month is called the Feast of Trumpets. And this is a prophecy of the great message of warning that goes to the world like a trumpet sound that the day of the Lord is, is getting close and that the time of judgment is near. The trumpet warning. The Bible says that sound the trumpet, the day of the Lord is approaching. Now according to the medical textbooks, at the first day of the seventh month, the baby's hearing is fully developed. The baby can now distinguish between one sound and another for the first time. For example, a trumpet can be understood by the baby as a trumpet. It wouldn't know what it was, but it can recognise the difference in sounds. Okay, the first day of the seventh month, the trumpet was to sound. And the trumpet is a warning that we're into the end times. Now the unborn human baby, the first day of the seventh month, the baby can for the first time recognise and dif differentiate with sound. So in the salvation context, the first day of the seventh month has to do with sound, the trumpet, sounding. In the unborn baby context, the first day of the seventh month has to do with sound, differentiating and understanding sound. Isn't that amazing? See how God has put a parallel between the physical and the spiritual? Absolutely astonishing. So the baby can now understand sound for the first time on the first day of the seventh month of pregnancy. The sixth feast in the Bible feasts is called the Day of Atonement. And this was on the tenth day of the seventh month. The tenth day of the seventh month. Now the Ark of the Covenant played a role in the Day of Atonement because the ark actually represented the throne of God in heaven, where God's presence is, sitting between the cherubims. Well, I don't want you going to the Vatican and, and, and thinking the Pope is God because he sits between two cherubims in the Vatican. Oh yeah, he knows that God rules between the cherubim on a throne. And uh, I've been to the Vatican and there is the Pope's throne, and there's the two cherubims over it. But forgetting that, let's get back now to the, the real one. The Ark of the Covenant, the word covenant actually was, was a name given to the box of the covenant. The covenant meaning the Ten Commandments, because Moses was told, put the words of the tables of the covenant inside the Ark, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is what we've all broken. This is how the trouble began. We broke God's law. Sin is the transgression of the law. And we cannot help ourselves. We die. There's no hope for us. But God in his wonderful love wants us to live forever. And so he has provided mercy. Mercy, his own son coming and dying for us. And the fact that mercy is provided by our wonderful Heavenly Father because he loves us so much. Over the law there is placed a lid on the Ark of the Covenant called the Mercy Seat. But mercy is not possible unless somebody pays the penalty for the broken law. And if we're going to pay for it, we have no hope. But he who has done no sin pays for it we can go free. I may have told the story to you before, but it is worth retelling. A television personality 
was, was traveling over a bridge and he was in a hurry for an appointment. So he raced over the bridge beyond the speed limit. At the other end of the bridge was a traffic cop waiting for him. Oh, oh. He pulled him over and he wrote out the ticket and he said, show me your driver's license. And then as the man handed his license across to the traffic cop, the traffic cop looked at his face and said, I recognize you. My wife loves your show. Oh, well, the law must be satisfied. The penalty must be paid. I cannot tear up the ticket. But let me do something. He reached into his wallet and he handed $50 over to the, the, the driver who had done wrong and said, now, you are free. That fine now is paid by you. I've paid it for you, but don't drive like that again. God said, I have paid the penalty for you. You are free, but go and sin no more. And that is what the Ark of the Covenant message is. That was the lesson it was designed to teach. We are all sinners. We need mercy. It's only by the blood of Jesus as our sacrifice taking our place that we can live forever in the presence of God. That's the message. And so on the Day of Atonement, the priest went in and sprinkled the blood. Now this was not the sacrifice taking place. The sacrifice had already taken place. But the, the ceremony that now happened was the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat over the law. Now in the judgment, we're going to be judged by God's law. Are we covered by the blood of Jesus? That's the question. The judgment is set, the books are open, says the prophet Daniel. And this is the day when all is reconciled. That's the meaning of atonement. At one moment. When everything is brought back and reconciled at, as one. To make an atonement, the life is in the blood. It was only the blood of Jesus that could give us life. In the judgment, it is Jesus' blood found covering us that gives us life eternal when the books are opened and our names come up. Heaven's sanctuary is then cleansed of all blame. We are free. Jesus' blood is, is acceptable. Uh, Satan, the accuser, is condemned. And Jesus and the faithful are granted the kingdom. And that's in the prophecy of Daniel 7 at the time of the judgment, the pre-advent judgment before Jesus returns. And so in the salvation context, on the 10th day of the seventh month, Christ's blood is declared to be acceptable. The angels are satisfied. They are the ones that have to look into the books before Jesus returns and says to the angels, go and gather my people. There has to be no doubt at all as to whose people are ready to be gathered and who, is, who can be trusted in heaven and who can't. And when the blood of Jesus is found over you and over each one of us, we are declared saved. The judgment then grants us eternal life and Jesus returns for us. I mean, we know it's given to us the moment we confess our sins, but there is a judgment at the end before the angels come to get us. They are going to look into the books and they're going to see us covered by his blood. Blood declared to be acceptable. Now, on the 10th day of the seventh month, just like the biblical day of the atonement feast, so with the unborn child. This day concerns the blood. Up until now, because the fetus does not breathe, it depends on the oxygen through the mother's blood circulation coming into it. But the fetal blood 
which receive the mother's oxygen must eventually be changed so that the baby, when it is born, can carry oxygen without the mother. Now, technically, the haemoglobin of the blood must change from that of a fetus to that of a self-breathing human being. And according to the, the medical textbooks, the blood change takes place on the 10th day of the 7th month. Just as in the old biblical law, the high priest must present the blood on the mercy seat precisely on the 10th day of the 7th month. And just as the high priest entered the most holy place in the sanctuary with blood, which prophesied Jesus entering into judgment to plead his blood on our behalf. So the blood of the unborn child enters the most holy place, if you like, of this earthly tabernacle. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's just another application. So the blood is declared acceptable. And how wonderful this is. There you've got the changing of the blood in the body of the unborn child to make it blood acceptable because the life is in the blood. In the salvation context, Christ's blood covering our sins is declared to be acceptable. And so he is granted the kingdom and we with him as a result of that judgment in heaven. Now on the unborn human baby, on the same 10th day of the 7th month, the embryo's blood is now acceptable for it to live without anything covering it. So here you've got a pattern between the physical and the spiritual laws. We've now reached the 10th day of the 7th month in the development of a human child, but the baby is not ready to be born one more thing has to happen for this to be possible. Now the seventh feast is the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day of the seventh month. And this was also called the Feast of the Harvest. It's a feast of rejoicing. And Jesus says the harvest is what? the end of the world. On the 15th day of the seventh month, that's when the lungs are developed. And uh, from this time onward, the baby could be delivered and live because everything is ready for birth. Salvation context. On the 15th day of the seventh month, Christ's people are delivered to live with him. Daniel talks about it in, in a, a context. At that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone who shall be found written in the book. Those who are not covered by the blood of Jesus, represented by the sixth feast on this, during the judgment, where Jesus is declared his blood is, is acceptable, the people who are covered by his blood are acceptable, Jesus and the, his people can now receive the kingdom. And that was typified by a feast that occurred on the 15th day of the seventh month, so in the unborn human baby on the 15th day of the seventh month, the embryos can now virtually be delivered and still survive. So this is about deliverance and life eternal. The Feast of Tabernacles. And the Bible talks about God says his tabernacle will be with us. And we will tabernacle with him. And just as a baby is ready for birth and can survive, 
so God's people will be ready for eternal life with Jesus. And that's why he comes to get them. And that's why this time of history is so important, friends. Can you be trusted to live in heaven without spoiling it? Do you get upset with things too easily? Are you covering up some sin that you, you still cherish? Have you repaid where you've taken from people? Have you made everything right with your fellow man? Have you made everything right with God? Are you ready to be delivered? If not, the time is getting short. Very, very soon it will be here. One final note. Just as with the baby, so with Jesus' return. We cannot know the exact day and hour of the birth of a child, can we? But from that, from that uh, date that we just gave earlier, it could be delivered if, if the circumstances were necess necessitating it. The, the child could survive, it could be delivered successfully. But after that, we don't really know when it's going to be born, but we can observe the travail of birth pangs. So we know not the exact day and hour when God's people will be delivered, but we see the travail of the birth pangs, don't we? Aren't they occurring now? Okay. I'd just like to leave that message with you, and I hope it's been a blessing. The physical and the spiritual. Now, friends, I'd like to make this point too. You show that to an atheist. Ask them to explain how the Bible written 3,500 years ago, those, the book of Leviticus written 3,500 years ago, lines up perfectly with what's been discovered in modern times now in the 21st century. The 14th day of the first month, 14th day of the first month. 15th day of the first month, 15th day of the first month. Two to six days later, two to six days later. The 50th day after, the 50th day after. The first day of the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month. The 10th day of the seventh month, the 10th day of the seventh month. The 15th day of the seventh month, the 15th day of the seventh month. Yet we cannot give a date, a definite date for the birth of the baby we can, and, and the deliverance of the baby. We cannot give a de definite date for the deliverance of God's people. Only God, the creator who made the human birth process, could have given us the book of Leviticus 23. Only God could have known the correlation of the physical and the spiritual. I leave that with you. Let's glorify him. And Peter, would you like to close this meeting in prayer, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. Thank you. That's Neil. Our dear Father in heaven, Father, we just marvel as we watch the wonders of your creation and the wonderful plan of salvation that you've presented to us. Thank you for this knowledge that you've given us. And may it lead us to even greater consecration to you, Lord. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Please give us victory over all sin, Lord, that we, and help us, Lord, and strengthen us that we may glorify you and honour you for all that you've done for us and all that you are doing for us. Lord, we just praise you and we just love you and we just give our hearts to you, Lord. Please dwell in our hearts and use us to your glory. I pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.